Hello, I'm Brenna Bay, a partner with Edwin Co. Welcome to our podcast series about residential construction. In these podcasts, we discuss matters which arise on residential construction projects. Numerous of the topics discussed are also covered in our guide entitled What to Know Before You Start Digging a Hole, which can be found on our website. I would highlight that the information within these podcasts is general guidance only and may not necessarily apply to your particular situation since every construction project is different. Therefore, I strongly recommend that you seek professional advice before you undertake any sort of construction project or sign any appointments or contracts. In our last podcast, we looked at time for completion of a project. We examined circumstances which entitle a contractor to an extension of time and discussed what happens if the contractor does not complete the works on time. Time is, of course, a critical aspect of a construction project. So much so, that parties often want works to commence on site before their contract is finalized. So in this podcast, we will look at letters of intent and their potential use in such circumstances. Having listened to our previous podcasts, you understand how important it is to enter into an appropriate written building contract with your contractor. Of course, it takes time to negotiate all of the details of a construction contract, and often there is pressure to commence the works or procure certain long lead items as soon as possible in order to meet a particular completion date. While in an ideal world, you would conclude your contract before any works commenced. In reality, parties often need a method by which some of the works can start on site prior to completion of the contract. The solution is often a letter of intent. What exactly is a letter of intent? It is a letter from an employer to a contractor which expresses an intention that the parties might enter into a formal contract at a later date. In the meantime, the employer is requesting the contractor to undertake a subset of the works and limits the amount the employer will be liable to pay the contractor for such works. A key feature generally associated with letters of intent is a belief that they are not binding. That is, that there is no actual contract between the parties. While normally a letter of intent will clearly state that the employer is not obliged to grant a full contract for the works to the contractor. Typically, the letter itself is a binding contract for those early works which the parties agree will be undertaken pursuant to the letter of intent. It is imperative to understand that once you allow a contractor to commence any aspect of the building works, your negotiation power diminishes. Therefore, I strongly recommend that you do not agree to the commencement of any works even under a letter of intent, unless various of the key contractual matters have been discussed and agreed, or you are confident that you would part ways with the contractor in the event that your desired terms cannot be agreed. If you decide to proceed based on a letter of intent, the letter should detail all of the terms and conditions which have been agreed between the parties in order to ensure that you have sufficient protection. Matters which should be addressed in the letter of intent include, but are not limited to, the contract price, the proposed completion date, the level of liquidated damages, the amount of the retention, the level and basis of the insurance which the contractor is required to maintain, full details of the works insurance, requirements for any collateral warranties which are to be provided by the contractor or any of its subcontractors, provision of a latent defects policy where the project involves the building of a new home, along with any other project-specific provisions, such as any risk allocations which have been agreed. If the majority of the above items have not already been agreed, you should carefully consider whether you should be entering into a letter of intent or allowing any of the works to commence, since your negotiation position will be weakened once the contractor gets on site. Since the letter of intent is a contract with regard to those works undertaken under the letter, the letter of intent also needs to contain various standard provisions found in a construction contract. For example, a letter of intent should always clearly indicate the works to be carried out and limit your liability in relation to the amount of monies you have to pay pursuant to the letter. The letter will also need terms addressing everything from payment and copyright to termination of the letter and dealing with any disputes. It is also advised that a letter has an expiration date 
As this reminds the parties, that the letter is meant to be a temporary measure to cover a short period whilst the parties are seeking to finalize the contract. Serious consequences can arise where a letter of intent is used and a contract is not concluded. In such a situation, much will depend on the state of the negotiations between the parties and the terms which have been agreed. What is important to remember is that without a proper finalized contract, your rights and remedies will likely be compromised and your payment obligations might not be limited. Overall, a letter of intent needs to be viewed as a binding contract by which you are engaging the contractor to carry out a specific, limited set of tasks within a short, limited period, and in return, you will pay a limited maximum fee. If you and the contractor do enter into a formal building contract, any works undertaken or monies paid pursuant to the letter of intent should be assumed into the contract. So in this podcast, we've discussed letters of intent. Letters of intent can serve a useful purpose where there's a particular need for works to commence prior to the completion of a contract. However, there are numerous risks to using letters of intent. First, once works commence on-site, your power in relation to finalizing the negotiation of the contract diminishes. Additionally, numerous issues arise where parties misunderstand the binding nature of a letter of intent, or where the works proceed based on a letter of intent and the contract is never concluded. Consequently, it's important to remember that a letter of intent is meant to be a limited solution only, and you should ensure that you either enter into the full contract for the works, or, if terms cannot be agreed, you walk away and find a different contractor. Finally, as with any contract, it is strongly recommended that you do not sign a letter of intent without first obtaining legal advice. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast and will join us again next time.